Well, hello guys and welcome back to another episode on the Saga channel. Today, we're going to visit a hyperbaric chamber and have a look at all the bells and whistles and how everything works. So, let's do it. So guys, my name is Nick. I'm a technical diving instructor, trainer, and a hyperbaric chamber operator. And uh, most of you are probably scuba divers. That's probably why you're watching this channel, probably why you clicked the video in the first place. Um, and most of you are probably interested in how a hyperbaric chamber works. So um, I'm, a, I'm an operator here. I have hundreds of hours on this particular uh, unit. So that gives us a great opportunity to look a little closer and look how everything works and how everything is configured. If you like this type of content, guys, uh, subscribe to the channel. We make videos about all kinds of diving topics regularly. And if you like the video, maybe leave a like. If you have questions, get in the comment section. I always answer. Um, so this here, guys, this is a Amron uh, multi-place deck chamber. Uh, it's a relatively small, there are definitely bigger chambers, but there are also claustrophobically small chambers. So we're on a tiny Caribbean island, uh, Utila. Uh, so having one of these is actually pretty amazing. Uh, help can often be pretty far away uh, and having a chamber like this one on site definitely mitigates a lot of the risk. So let's have a look. So since most of you guys are scuba divers, uh, you probably know how decompression sickness works. A diver overstays their bottom time, accumulates too much inert gas into the tissues and upon ascent, uh, all kinds of symptoms may uh, start to happen because of the gas coming out of solution too fast, right? Um, the best way to cure this, right, is by recompressing the patient. So in other words, we're going to bring the patient back to depth. Obviously not underwater, uh, but in a hyperbaric chamber, we're recompressing the patient. Uh, usually, especially with decompression sickness, uh, the patient immediately feels a lot better just because of the recompression. Uh, that's because the bubbles are forced back into solution, into the tissues. This by itself is obviously not a solution because the patient is at depth and obviously can't remain there. We then put the patient on oxygen, usually 100% at 60 feet, uh, that's uh, 2.8 PO2 uh, partial pressure. That's pretty high, higher than, than you would safely breathe underwater, but it really helps in a hyperbaric chamber to uh, increase that pressure gradient and help off-gas the nitrogen. So let's have a look at the control panel here. This is where the operator will spend most of the time during a treatment. Right here, we have the uh, regulator. So obviously we don't want the full force of the compressor acting on the chamber. And the regulator, usually set between 300 and 450 PSI, mitigates that incoming pressure. From there, we can actually serve two parts of the chamber. This is a multi-place chamber, meaning that there are two separate components on the inside that can be pressurized independently from one another. This is useful, especially because we usually only pressurize the inner lock and when we need to transport people or uh, medication waste in or out, we can use the outer lock, bring it down to the depth that the treatment is happening, do whatever exchange needs to happen, and then uh, depressurize the outer lock and maybe remove uh, human waste or whatever it may be that needs to, to leave the chamber. So everything we see here is a mirror image of one another. Uh, right here, this lever, uh, this valve, controls the input of air into the chamber after the regulator. And on these uh, gauges, we can actually see the depth, which is expressed in feet or meters of seawater. Typical treatment, uh, table six anyway, will happen at 60 feet or 18 meters of seawater. So um, with this lever, we can actually control the speed that the chamber gets compressed. Obviously we need to watch, there's a porthole here. We can actually see uh, and communicate visually with the people inside, making sure nobody has any equalization problems so we can keep the descent rate uh, at a reasonable uh, speed. Then um, right here, we have a uh, similar 
valve, uh, this is the exhaust valve. So when we depressurize the chamber, that's the valve that we'll do that with. Um, it does happen that we operate both valves at the same time, uh, namely when the chamber gets too hot or too humid and we wanna just uh, ventilate. We want to bring air in and out at the same time. So a little bit more of a tricky maneuver because while doing that we want to make sure that the patients stay at a constant depth. This is our oxygen. So this is the uh, breathing gas for the patient and usually at the end of the treatment also for the tender. Um, the uh, oxygen comes straight from an industrial gas supplier, goes via this regulator uh, into the uh, chamber, in the inside of the chamber, there'll be a BIPS system, some face masks that the, uh, the patient and the tender use uh, to get the maximum dosage of oxygen. So we already briefly mentioned earlier that uh, if we operate at 18 meters or 60 feet and we breathe 100% oxygen, we're actually getting 2.8 atmospheres uh, of partial pressure. So that's pretty high. That's Depending on which uh, agency you dive with, um, it's somewhere around two times the uh, lethal dose or two times the maximum dose uh, of partial pressure oxygen. Now we can get away with this in a chamber because we're not underwater. The patient is reasonably still and the rewards outweigh the risks in that without the treatment, there is no positive outcome for the patient. The patient is already uh, in trouble, of course. Um, up here, we have a communications system. So uh, at all times, we can actually communicate with the people inside the chamber. And here we have a set of instruments. So at all times, we know obviously what depth they're at, uh, but we also know the temperature inside, we know the humidity, we know the carbon dioxide levels and the oxygen levels. Uh, even though the patients are using a uh, mouth mask to uh, take the oxygen. Sometimes it happens that oxygen escapes into the uh, atmosphere inside the chamber. We wanna keep those levels low to avoid any risk, uh, especially uh, some kind of ignition uh, uh, incident we wanna absolutely avoid, of course. Um, carbon dioxide levels, for obvious reasons, also need to stay sufficiently uh, low. Um, but that is basically, in, in rough terms, that is how a hyperbaric chamber uh, is operated. So it's maybe not as uh, complex as you might think. So here we can actually see the inside of our chamber. And as I mentioned earlier, there is an inner lock back there. That's where the actual treatment usually happens. And then there is the outer lock, which is this area uh, right here. Uh, again, that's the area that we can pressurize independently to either send personnel or medication down or to bring resources back to the surface um, should we need to do that uh, before the treatment is over. So we can actually get a little bit more inside here. So this is it guys, we're inside the hyperbaric chamber. This is the inner lock. This is where the treatments happen. Um, when this massive door closes, that's it, we're in a little bubble, a little atmosphere of our own, and we can basically be pressurized uh, to whatever pressure is needed for the treatment. As I said, the ambient atmosphere uh, is usually air. That is the safest way to operate the chamber. And then we have a um, regulator system, that normally has a mask right here that the patient and uh, the tender can breathe from to get the oxygen dosage that they need. Also in the chamber, we find these headphones. Uh, that's because it can get pretty loud in here, especially when the chamber is getting pressurized. When the chamber gets pressurized, much like filling a scuba cylinder, it also gets really, really hot in here. Uh, we try to mitigate that by ventilating the chamber as we go, as I described earlier. And then of course, we have a lot of drinking water inside the chamber to keep patient and tender hydrated. Um, there's an elevated area here that is usually where the patient will take place. And then there is a lower area where I'm sitting and that's where the tender um, 
usually takes their position. Uh, <laughs> really, relatively small space, I agree, especially if you know that a table six treatment can take close to five hours, uh, sometimes longer. Um, it gets pretty cozy in here, that's for sure. Now, we also have a fire extinguisher, water-based, right here, uh, as well as bedpans and some other first aid um, tools. So that is the inside of the chamber. I'm gonna get back out because it's, uh, it's a little bit, even, even without <laughs> pressurization, it's relatively warm in here actually. So hopefully you guys learned a thing or two about the basics of how a hyperbaric chamber works. But if you have more questions, feel free to type them in the comments and I'll make sure to answer. And if you like content like this, obviously subscribe to the channel. We make videos like this regularly, especially for scuba divers. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you next time.